This week on Waterways. Exotic fish species in South Florida. And overseas paddling trail. Xenophobia, a fear of foreigners. We are taught in this great big melting pot called America not to fear people from faraway lands. However, there are a number of wildlife biologists in South Florida who do fear foreigners. These biologists are not afraid of foreign humans. Instead, they fear a horde of foreign fishes. In the 1950s, South Florida's marshes and canals teemed with native sunfish, killifish, and live bearers like the mosquito fish. Today, those same waters are ruled by fishes from South America, Central America, and Africa. Exotic, foreign, not native. Foreign or exotic fishes are something to fear. In parts of the United States, they have squeezed out native fish so efficiently that the natives are now extinct. In other places, they pushed the natives onto the endangered species list. Biologists like Jeff Klein are eager to protect South Florida's natives. Today, he's checking just outside the boundary of Everglades National Park, looking for foreign fishes that might cross the line and invade the park's protected waters. Uh, I just threw this trap net out. It's a meter square, uh, open on the top and the bottom. There's this mesh on the sides, and it, uh, what it does is it encircles a meter square and we count the vegetation uh, and collect the fish and invertebrates out of this. The throw traps and techniques Jeff uses were specially designed to catch fishes that live among plants in the shallow Everglade marshes. Klein sweeps a net through the meter square sample and collects the fishes within. After we run the bar sand through and we haven't collected fish for a set number of sands, then we dip net through and we uh, try to dig fish out of the, the sediment. Today, Klein finds no new species. But in 2000, in this same place, he found an African fish called the jewel cichlid. Since his discovery, the jewel cichlid has spread throughout the entire eastern portion of Everglades National Park. In some places, the jewel cichlid has become the dominant fish, outnumbering all native species. Where did the jewel cichlid come from? Originally, Africa, but it is a common resident in many home aquariums. Though popular, it is a very aggressive fish, and biologists speculate when pet owners put them into their home aquariums, they don't play nicely with the other fishes. Eventually, the owners set the cichlids loose into the wild, an illegal but common act in Florida. Scientists don't yet have enough information to know how the jewel cichlid is affecting the Everglades, but it's clear the changes are dramatic and the jewel cichlid is just one of many exotics thriving in South Florida. Mayan cichlids are one of the most ubiquitous of the exotic fishes throughout South Florida and in, um, in the Everglades. And they are both collected within the fresh waters and are known to be collected uh, in the brackish waters as well along uh, Florida Bay and coastal areas. Mayan cichlids originate down in the Yucatan Peninsula. In fact, in remote creeks that drain from the Everglades into Florida Bay, the Mayan cichlid is, in terms of weight and numbers, the ruling fish. Another fish Klein has collected is the black acara, a fish from South America, and the list goes on. One of the newest exotic fishes in Everglades National Park is this armored catfish. They have only been in the park of, well, the first one collected was in 2002, and their population appears to be spreading along. They were first recorded in Florida in, from the Indian River drainage and the Kissimmee River drainages, and 
have either moved south very rapidly since the mid 90s when they were first collected to be in the park uh, in 2002. Klein estimates that there are another eight to 10 foreign or exotic species in the canal system just outside Everglades National Park. He believes it is just a matter of time before these species turn up within the park's boundaries. Introduced, brought into a new place. How did these African, South and Central American fish make it to Florida? They most certainly did not swim here on their own. Many of the fish that have invaded Florida came from the aquarium trade. The release might have happened like this. A person in South Florida buys a colorful fish for their tanks. The fish grows too big or the person just grows tired of it. Unsure of their options, they dump the fish into the canal that runs through their neighborhood. Certainly aquarists who uh, in some cases are trying to be fairly uh, uh, humane and rather than killing their fish if it gets too large for their aquarium, they think it's a nice thing to take it out and introduce it into the natural environment where it'll have a home. It's not a very good thing to do. It's also illegal to do. And uh, we are fairly certain that a number of the species that we have in South Florida have resulted from that kind of activity. Another source of exotics is the fish market. Many people in the U.S. crave the taste of fish native to Asia in East Africa, such as the snakehead and the tilapia. Rather than import these fish, some dealers have chosen to try to raise them locally and illegally in nearby ponds and canals. The fishes soon escape. The public needs to understand that it is illegal even to possess fish such as snakeheads and tilapia. The offense is punishable by a fine and prison time. Ecological release term used to describe how a new species expands and multiplies when it's freed from its native predators and diseases. Why do exotic species multiply like gremlins in South Florida? Why do they take over canals and marshes formerly dominated by native species? The explanation goes something like this. When a fish from Africa or South America is brought to Florida, all the things that kept it in check in its homeland, predators, diseases, and parasites, do not come with it. In its new home, it is free from these constraints. It has a leg up on the native fishes, which are eaten every day by native predators and ravaged by native diseases. The new fish multiply and begin to outcompete native fish for food and habitat. There are a few species that have been introduced here. Uh, I'll take an example of blue tilapia, which grows to often three or four pounds in weight which actually becomes very large and almost unhandleable by many of the native predators, with the exception of alligators. But even there, they're, they're much too fast often for alligators to, to eat. Refuge, a shelter or protection from danger or distress. Areas like this canal provide refuge to fishes. Um, often, a lot of the fish inside canals are exotic fishes. And uh, the canals provide the exotics refuge from cold winter temperatures. A lot of the exotic fishes in South Florida are from tropical climates, so they can't withstand freezing temperatures that the native fish can. However, canals are deep enough that the temperature at the bottom of the canals remain within a tolerable level and the exotics can withstand the winters in South Florida that way. The canals that crisscross the state of Florida offer hundreds of miles of refuge for the exotic tropical fishes that have invaded Florida. When the temperature drops to a lethal 40 or 50 degrees, the water at the bottom of the canal is still a safe 73 degrees Fahrenheit. For an exotic species to spread, it needs a way to get around. Florida has a man-made fish highway system that couldn't work better if it had been designed to spread exotic fishes. Development really began in South Florida with canal building probably around the turn of the 20th century and the idea was that much of the landscape down here was too wet for urban development and for agriculture and in order to make the area more attractive to those kinds of developments canals were excavated and levees were built to contain water and to drain water off the landscape. Uh, in doing so we not only modified 
the hydrological, the water conditions that one finds in the natural system, but we also created a very large network of artificial habitats. Habitats that were both much deeper and much warmer than most of the natural aquatic habitats in South Florida, and that were all interconnected so that uh, if you were a fish and you were introduced in Fort Lauderdale or Miami, in a few years you could actually swim across the state and make it to Tampa or Fort Myers. And this is exactly what we're seeing happening with many of these introduced fishes right now. Conservation, the act of keeping something from being damaged, lost, or wasted. Given the number of exotic species loose in Florida and the ease with which they multiply, are our native fishes in danger? Will we see our natives disappear? This is a very serious problem. We don't really want to have uh, our state changed any more than it has already from one that represented Florida to now that's this cosmopolitan mixture of animals from all over the world that, uh, you know, it's just changed the entire evolutionary trajectory of where the state is going now. You know, we don't know what the state is going to look like in terms of its fish fauna 25 or 50 years from now. Florida has the unfortunate distinction of being home to more exotic fishes than any other state in the nation. Miraculously, these exotics have not yet caused any native Florida fishes to go extinct. But the problem is quickly getting worse. When I first began working down here, many of the introduced species that were established in South Florida were restricted to the canal system. And we had only uh, uh, perhaps two or three species which had progressed into the natural system. However, in the last few years in particular, probably since the year 2000, we've picked up another four species which have made it into the park, giving us a total now of about 10 species that are actually breeding within the natural ecosystem. The exotics are increasing in species and in numbers. They're moving from canals near cities and suburbs into remote places within our parks. As Bill Loftus attests, biologists have few options to stop the fish. Any action that would kill the exotics would also kill the natives. It's obvious that we're not being very proactive in this issue. We really need to have much better monitoring. And one of the places where we're really falling down is that we do not have a very big toolbox for trying to either control and even more difficultly eradicate these fishes when they first appear in the system. Even with the, the monitoring networks that we have in place for fishes, we still usually detect these fish after they've been in the system for a while and have built up numbers to the point where they are detectable. And at that point, when you're dealing with such a wide open system as the Everglades, with this interconnected canal system and these vast marshes, once a fish gets in there, it's very, very difficult to do anything about trying to control it. Prevention, the act of keeping an event from happening. Some say an ounce is worth a pound of cure. Biologists have come to realize that the only real way to protect native fishes is to stop the invasion of exotics before they happen. Everglades National Park and their partners have started a campaign to encourage pet owners to don't let it loose. Instead, give that fish back to the pet shop. Give it to a friend. While owners might think they're giving a fish life by letting it loose into the wild, they may be bringing our native fish to their doom. Please, don't let it loose. Each year, millions of people visit the Florida Keys. Though they're surrounded by more than four million acres of wild places, most won't get very far from the highway. A small group of people are working on an effort that they hope will change that. Their project, the Florida Keys Overseas Paddling Trail, will run from Miami to Key West. The trail will open up the backcountry for visitors willing to dip a paddle and explore. The Florida Keys is an awesome place to set up a paddling trail because it's not Although it's not wilderness, there's so much beauty here, and it, it is developed, but it's, it's low-level development. It's not massive condos and stuff. Um, there's so much nature. Once you get on the water, you're paddling with the stingrays, you're paddling with the sea turtles and dolphins and manatees and all the birds. So with the clear water we have down here and the, the climate, 
I think it's a great place to set up a paddling trail so that people will come and not have to feel like they're figuring it out for themselves. We can set up the, the stops along the way and make it a little easier for everybody. The things that the trail has to offer is the 23 Flagler Railroad Historical Bridges. There's five National Wildlife Refuges. There's, uh, we're in the National Marine Sanctuary. We're next to the World Heritage Site of Everglades National Park and Biscayne National Park. We have 10 state parks in Monroe County. Um, there's an underwater park. Um, you can paddle from into and out of all of these parks. So it, it's an island chain, a tropical island chain. So you don't find that anywhere else in the country. The overseas paddling trail won't be a trail in the sense of a charted and marked route. Rather, the trail will offer a network of launch points, stopovers, and even camping sites. These sites will allow visitors to cast off from a point of their choice and take a trip that lasts several hours or several days. We don't see the trail as being used by people that want to go the whole length of the Keys. It could also be used by people that just want to do a day trip or an overnight or two nights, you know. So we want people to be able to pick the section they want to do and um, enjoy it in small doses. But even short day trips offer something special. Well, it's great, you know, within a mile of the Keys in some cases, a mile, mile and a half, um, there's some great patch reefs in certain areas, and these are little patches of coral that are shallow. On a calm day, it's, it's definitely within range of a, of a kayak, and, and that'd be a wonderful way, I think. You could have a slow trip out there, seeing everything, um, snorkel around the, the patch reef and, and head back home. For a lot of people, kayaking is a, a sport itself, and people just want to get from one place to another. But uh, but kayaking or, or, or canoeing is, is a great way to do some other things. Uh, fishing is one of the things that we see most often. Folks go out of, out of Flamingo and, and fish the flats. It's a, it's a wonderful way to, to move silently over in really shallow water. Snorkeling, um, you know, a lot of times I'll throw a mask or fins inside, uh, inside the a kayak and when I get to a place go over the go over the tra the uh, gunnel and see what I can see. Paddlers will also find winding saltwater creeks lined with the prop roots of red mangroves. South Florida is the only place in the United States where you can find mangroves. These tropical trees flourish in the Keys. When you're out on a kayak, you're right on the water. You can uh, paddle the flats real shallow water areas and that's where you see all the marine life instead of going 50 miles an hour. You know, you can nice slow steady pace three miles, four miles an hour. You see more marine life and wildlife in short distances in a kayak than you would zooming by. Some creeks and grass flats are too shallow for motorboats. Paddlers can enjoy the quiet in these areas. The paddling trail had its start more than five years ago. During the 1990s, paddling shop owner Frank Wall and some of his fellow paddlers cooked up the idea. Frank and his wife Monica took the idea to the state of Florida. And the state loved the idea, so they kept saying to pursue it and come to the meetings and um, to continue with the program, which there really was no program, so I didn't know where I was supposed to go with it. Um, with all the politics and all, but eventually everybody was listening and they caught on and now the state's taking it over the county, and the national park system, uh, which is great. You know. Other agencies and organizations have pitched in. Paradise Paddlers, a nonprofit paddling group headed by Monica Wall, has led the way. Right now the paddling trail is being developed with the support of Paradise Paddlers. We have Monroe County involved. We have the Florida Department of Environmental Protection, Office of Greenways and Trails, 
and the Florida Park Service. We have gotten some interest from U.S. Fish and Wildlife, Fish and Con Conservation Commission, and um, we recently got national recognition from the Department of Interior as a national recreational trail. Despite everyone's interest, the organizers need the help of volunteers and local landowners to make the trail a success. Monica and Paradise Paddlers are seeking help with fundraisers and cleanups. They're looking for local businesses that might want to offer their property as a launch spot for kayaks. If anyone wants to get involved in the trail, whether it's through cleanups, um, whether it's through um, participating in the events, we've had bike kayak events, um, we plan to have several of those a year. Um, if anyone has a business that's on the water and wants it to be a paddler friendly place and you want to be on the map because we're working on a map, um, you can get involved that way. And another way to get involved is if anyone has any property that's on the water that could be a good place for paddlers to stop um, and possibly camp. Um, whatever way anyone wants to set it up, we can work out a cooperative agreement. So they can contact myself for now um, at Florida Bay Outfitters. The thought of spending the night under the stars in the tropics appeals to many people. The trail's organizers are working to make it possible for paddlers to camp overnight in the backcountry. But they'll need support from the community to make it happen. Right now the National Park Service is working with uh, local people and, uh, and with other agencies to locate places where we could uh, have an overnight site. And this would be a raised platform called a chicky, where people could paddle out and set up their tent and spend the night. If their work goes according to plans, the trail, overnight sites, maps, and launch points should be finished in a few years. We think the trail should be finished in five or six years, hopefully with all the cooperation we're getting from the National Park Service, the state parks, um, Deborah's been really great in um, getting me in the paddling trail to, to get active because it's something we've wanted to do but owning a business also it's been hard to make the time for it. So we've got all these people now interested so with all this momentum I think it should be completed in five years easily. Um, with ideas turned into plans and plans turned into action, the Overseas Kayak Trail is making steady progress. The trail could foster a renewed appreciation for Florida Bay and it could attract more visitors, thus stimulating the Keys economy. Who knows what could result from the ripple effect created by the trail? Maybe a resort tailored to paddlers? Or maybe a paddler's bar? Whatever direction this project takes from here, one would expect it to be a breath of fresh tropical air to the kayaking community and the Florida Keys. For more information on how you can help create the Overseas Kayak Trail, contact Florida Bay Outfitters, 205-458-1000.